Hey everybody and welcome to the Software Showcase, part two of our oral Bible translation extravaganza today. I'm joined as always in the studio by Glenn Oliver, our team's project manager and all-around great guy. I am Mark Stedman, Vice President of Information Technology, and today we have a special guest with us, Joe Sarabia. Welcome, Joe. Happy to be here, Mark, Glenn, and hello to everyone watching online. <laughs> so, Joe, you came to us as an intern in 2015. Yesterday, we talked about Recorder, and you were mm -hmm. uh, part of the original team that worked on that. Yep. And then you uh, stuck around. We just couldn't get rid of you. Actually, we were very happy to have you all these years. And so today, we have a new product uh, that you have been really the chief architect on mm -hmm. that's taking all those lessons we learned. So what are we going to talk about today, Glenn? Excellent. So finally, we we're actually able to talk a little bit about Orchard and be able to kind of show how it functions and the role that it plays. Um, if you can actually see my screen at the moment, we're also uh, unveiling Orature kind of as a new tool uh, to the existing tool sets that are on BibleTranslationTools.org. Uh, um, you should be able to soon be able to go there and find your way. Um, as we'll demonstrate today, it's got a whole lot of features that are enhancing on the experience that you might have had in uh, BTT Recorder, but certainly in the ability of what you can run it on. Right now, I've actually got a Windows machine. Um, you run this on, I think, your Macintosh. Mm -hmm. um, some of our other developers, including uh, Tony from yesterday, have been uh, running this on, on Linux and helping us test it out. Um, so it has a lo lot more capability. And ultimately, it's uh, going to be going back onto the Android. So we'll have uh, one piece of software that will be ubiquitous across anything that you want to run for your translation tools. Um, and it, the website here, of course, goes into uh, some more details in, in terms of the enhanced uh, languages and the fact that we are having a, uh, a piece of software that allows you to follow MAST more closely, not just be a tool that fits into the MAST process, but one that actually pairs very well with it. Um, with that, uh, let's leave the website for a moment and actually uh, take a look at the software. Glenn, so, Glenn, before we jump off oh. the website, I just want to help people in case they missed it because you said it pretty fast. You can check out the website by going to BibleTranslationTools.org and there will be a link for Orature. So the name of the product today is Orature, in case you haven't heard it before. So, Joe, what does Orature stand for? Uh, it stands for Oral Literature. So once you hear that, you're like, oh, yeah, I get it. That makes a lot of sense, right. Orature. Um, what I'm looking at here is uh, the, the program Orcher opened up. I've started some existing projects, and we that's what you see before here. And on the uh, left-hand side, we have kind of a, a navigation, more of an information um, uh, panel that lets us know kind of where we are. But first, let's just talk about some of the projects I've got here. Um, I've chosen to uh, display the projects here using this kind of quick key uh, a, a display of three letter codes so we can recognize the the books of the Bible um, but often it may be the case that there's pictures there representing them which makes it a lot easier for uh, cultures that you know are not necessarily preferring literate um, they can recognize the picture it's easier to describe hey go to the project that shows this or you're already familiar with that story that occurs in this gospel let's open up that one and, and resume so it's uh, it's used to en enhance uh, visual cues as well but since uh, we're primarily English readers here. Uh, this is also a quick way of us being able to do it. At the top of any of these given cards, we can also see the language, um, or you can see a representative of the, the book of the Bible in the language that it is in. Um, below the three letter language or the chapter book code, uh, we also have the actual language. So some of here are in uh, Roman script and some are in completely different scripts. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into one. So let's take a look at Portuguese for a moment. This is actually the uh, PTBR for any of those that are familiar with the code, but it is the uh, Brazilian form of Portuguese. So I'm going to open up John here. We'll notice that uh, the picture of John shows up here, confirming for us, yes, you are in the book of John and you're currently uh, looking at Portuguese. We see all of the chapters uh, within the book of John. And as I open up, let's say, the first chapter of John, we can see that it confirms for us, yep, you're over here. Now, not only does it show us the entire um, number of verses in the first chapter of John, but it also has a bar up here. And we'll come back and talk about this a little bit later. But for us, we're going to focus here on just opening up a single verse. We come back. And now we can see a couple things. Our screen has changed considerably in its nature. Uh, I now have what essentially looks to be one obvious thing to do, which is create a take. Um, and again, for Orcher right now, 
uh, we're, we're focusing on GLs. And so when you're narrating a GL, it is very um, helpful to have the scripture that you're focusing on right in front of you. It's also helpful for checking later on, but it's necessary for narration. In the past, this has been uh, a challenge for other software <laughs> that it was required uh, either paper or another screen and that enabled you to do that. So below here, we can see the, uh, the text. As I go ahead and click on the record, it brings me to the record screen. Now, for any of you who are familiar with, with uh, BTT Recorder or Translation Recorder, this will seem very similar because uh, that product was very simple to use and we wanted to pull that in. So even as I'm speaking right now, you can see this volume meter that is helping indicate uh, to me how the device is hearing me. How loud am I? If I was to creep closer to the uh, the microphone, it might uh, go to the red, letting me know I might be too close or too loud. Um, you might be using other devices, maybe headphones or um, other microphones to enhance that. And this would give you that kind of feedback of, do you have the right adjustment? Are you as loud as you want to be? At the top of the screen, of course, it allows us to understand where we currently are, confirming I'm uh, currently looking at Portuguese, uh, the book of John, chapter one, verse one. And down below, uh, again, the text that I would be reading. Right here, it says source audio not available. We'll come back to that later, but if source audio was available to us, it would allow us to play that. And that, of course, is very key for um, groups that need to listen uh, before they, they record or translate. Down below, all the way at the bottom, of course, we have a, a time-lapse recorder as we start recording. Now, the two, uh, two actions you can take on this screen are either to just start recording uh, or cancel. If for some reason I, I happened, it says verse one and I meant to be on verse two, I was off by one, I could go jump back to the previous screen and, and correct for that. Once I hit the recording uh, button, you can see it actively is recording my voice and it actually has changed in nature. So instead of being a record button, now it shows what we commonly think of as like a pause button. Why would you do that? Well, in case, uh, for example, oh, <clears throat> I needed a cough there, I wanted to stop recording, and then I could resume. I can hit that again. So it gives you a, a second to pause, or maybe you need to look at it, some sort of reference and come back, and that's fine during for, for drafting and whatnot. When you are actually finished with that, you would hit that uh, button again, it's returned to this state, and now that button, instead of saying cancel, says continue. Well, what's the next step? I've actually theoretically have recorded something, so I want to check my work. And now once again, you could see we have a new card here, which represents um, the take that I just made, and I could play this back here. And maybe we can hear that. I hope you guys can hear that at home. It should be playing back the take that I have. And I would be using the text down below to check my work. Did I get it accurately? Are all the words, all the phrases there? Uh, does it sound good to me? Did I, did I perhaps uh, go too fast or is it, did it come back too loud or too soft? Uh, I may want to make another take uh, in order to correct that. So I can simply come back in here, make another take. And now I have two takes. Uh, the idea here, uh, some groups, depending on how they go about it, might uh, simply delete the takes that they don't like. Um, say, you know what, I, I played that first one, I didn't, didn't really like that, I can delete that. In which case, you can go ahead and commit that. Um, other people prefer to uh, simply select the one that they think is probably better up into this area here which indicates to the program of the multiple copies, maybe you wanna keep them for whatever reason, uh, but I've promoted this one as being the best copy. Um, so that also helps anyone that's checking it uh, later on to say, okay, let me listen to this one first. It's probably the best one, yep, okay, good. And that person may have the responsibility of deleting the other takes. Um, to either side of this verse up here, you see I have the ability to just progress on to the next verse, so I could do that here. All right, so let's, uh, Let's go back for a moment here. So Glenn, let's take just a moment and, and just talk about what you've just shown. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of stuff. So we've kept some of the ideas from Recorder for the, for instance, the idea of takes. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea that when you're recording, you might take several tries before you get it right. So we keep all those takes, correct? Correct. Yep. yep. So as the, as the person who's either translating or narrating works through the process, they don't lose the first try they just can make a second take. They can take it again or a third time, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we've kept some of those ideas. 
but we have some different things like you showed. We had the text on screen for somebody who's narrating or if they're just using it to better understand the, the source audio. Correct. Okay. Right. So we've shown an instance here of what it looks like if you were just having text. So let's take a moment and actually look like what, uh, look at something that has an example of some source audio that is present. So I'm going to go back to my projects here and I'm going to go into the book of James and we'll go to the first chapter and similarly go to the verse first. Similar layout as we've seen before but now below that first verse I actually have source. So if, if, uh, if you are literate or and prefer to use language you've got that as an option but if uh, source audio is going to be uh, more important to the recording process you can again play it here um, or we can actually play it when before we take uh, the take here. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. We're going to get it without audio, audio it seems like. The producer is letting us know that the audio is not going out. So we're working on that at the moment. Okay. Should we unplug and just uh, hear it on the microphone? Or hear sure. it on speakers? We can give Let's that a again. shot. Turn your volume all the way up. These are the things, folks, that we work on before we start the show, and then they never go as planned. That sounds good. All right, let's do it this way. You know what, now that we've got this selected here, let me just go right ahead. I'm going to plug this back in, Mr. Producer. Okay, because if this works, this will be the best way to actually hear it. So let's go ahead. A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just on the to speakers. the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. Well, the good James. News. Okay. So let me the good news is the wire isn't working, but I think it's getting picked up by the mic. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try, if you don't mind, one more time, and we'll, we'll go, go for that a little bit later. Um, so we can hear that it's playing back for us, which can be very helpful for me, checking or in the, the translation or narration right. phase of this. So let's go back here for a moment and uh, also talk about the fact we've also seen the fact that we've got uh, embedded uh, software very similar to recorder to allow us to naturally record within the program um, but we have uh, recognized that other people um, are interested in using the tool and taking it to the next step so for example uh, recorder is fine it's great uh, helps you to blind draft very rapidly um, but it may not be the tool that you actually want to use for final editing and we've often seen in the field there might be a bunch of people with tablets and then when they're ready they find the one person, they bring them in a room, and they put them in front of a laptop usually, mm -hmm. and maybe Audacity or some other software, and they put a microphone and say, okay, all the work that's gone in translation, I want that one voice and that person to record it. Right. We recognize that that's actually something that they want to do. And so we've also built in the ability so that you can actually use that, utilize that software. So uh, this has been a fresh install today, so with all, all the joys that that brings, um, we have up here just a, an area where I also have um, other what we call plugins and one of the plugins is it, the the program is automatically recognized uh, that I'm using Ocean Audio and says hey great would you like to use Ocean Audio to be able to record instead of the native recorder so I'm going to actually go ahead and say yeah you know what for recording let's try it with Ocean Audio so now I'm going to go into I'm going to go into Acts here and I'm going to go in chapter one now let's actually take an opportunity to do something also very cool in a similar way to how I was recording a verse, I could also, with other editing software, take advantage of recording an entire chapter at a time. Mm. So you might understand if I have, uh, if I've got a microphone and maybe a professional studio and I'm using all this kind of stuff, it'd be very easy to record a chapter at a time. Maybe Joe starts going and he says, oh, I'll stop. And I've, I've got my cool, you know, Adobe software. And I'm like, oh, okay, let me erase that. Let me start. Okay, good, go ahead. And I could be running any filters or anything I need to do to make it good quality. So we also added the ability not only to record verses, but chapters at a time. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up X you'll see this screen has changed, right? I now have the ability to see all of the text for the entire chapter at one time. Again, very necessary if I'm using checking uh, or, or, uh, or narration for that. I'm gonna go ahead and record. What it does, the program now says, okay, I recognize you're gonna record a chapter at a time. Let me give you those resources in a separate window. Mm. Why? Because as you can see here, I've, I've opened up a different program and I might need to have that that resource of, of my text that I want to read, maybe on a different screen or part of the screen, so it's still accessible to me. So again, bringing that all together. 
Um, this may be a hard detail to see, but we can see at the top here, here's a, a, what this indicates is we're looking at English, UOB, Acts, chapter one, and, uh, and we're doing take one. So it already knows, by the way, you're, it's handed this off to the program, you're about to do chapter one, and that's the file that's gonna come back. So I'm gonna use this program, and we'll start recording. We'll see in the same way, oh, here's, here's uh, the same kind of action I'd expect. It's, it's responding to me recording. Um, if I stop that for a moment, uh, I can see that I have all kinds of effects, all the bells and whistles that I'd want in kind of professional or prosumer kind of software. Right. Um, if I was done, well, we can go ahead and do a little edit there. I didn't like that little space, whatever I want to do. Maybe I want to, uh, let's normalize. Ooh, that's nice. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm done with pretend I'm done with that and I'm going to save that. And now it's sent back that file. So right there. I'm able to use Orchard to kind of manage the process for me. I don't have to worry about the file naming. I don't have to worry about where I was. It keeps track of that for me. So here I'll just move that up and now I could proceed on to perhaps the next chapter if I wanted to. Before you go on to the next one, let's take yeah. just a moment and talk about Ocean Audio and that process because sure. that's such a great demo. So Ocean Audio is free software, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that we chose it is it's, it is free software and it's also pretty commonly used. And so we had requests coming in from the field, like Glenn said, of saying we need something that's more advanced. And rather than writing it ourselves, we just basically folded Ocean Audio into our workflow. And we've got a couple other packages that we support as well, right? Which are those? Um, Adobe um, Audition. Audition. Audition, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we tested Reaper as well in the past. Yeah, um, there, there's more that we're working on, uh, right. trying to figure out how to how to support. Uh, yeah. The two main ones are, are Ocean Audio and, and Adobe Audition. Okay. Um, and yeah, the, the thing that I like the most about that is, for for people who've been working with that software, it it's it's more complicated. Right. Uh, there's a lot of features, and they know how to use it. Right. And because we can, you know, provide the functionality to to allow them to use the existing software that they're already proficient with. Right. Uh, it just helps with the process. Yeah, if you think about what it would be like to have to create a file for each verse yourself, make mm -hmm. sure you name it right, sort, store it all in the right places so that you don't lose it, and then actually, if you then multiply that times multiple takes, that mm -hmm. becomes a, a nightmare to try to do by hand, and that's what uh, that's what Orature is taking care of. It's abstracting all that complication away from you, giving you the GUI to navigate through the chapters and verses, but still letting you use the high-end audio tool that you want to be able to do if you want to do things like volume correction, like mm -hmm. volume leveling or trimming and cropping things in and out or things like that. So yeah, good. Excellent. Um, so I wanted to take advantage of showing one other thing that I mentioned yesterday. And that was, you can see I've got a number of projects here. Some of them are in, again, scripts that are uh, non-Roman. Uh, so they, they look much different for me, but you can see that they, they're rendering here correctly. And I'm not sure if the cam was watching it before, but of course, we can see how that um, comes out in the font itself. Um, so that's really cool. But what happens when I don't see what I'm looking for? So for example, if I was to start this here, um, I have a number of languages that I installed today. I taught Orature how to understand the Bible in various different ULBs. Um, but when I install it for fresh, uh, then it only has English. Right. So I wanna add something to that. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna go back here for a moment. And uh, so, by the way, uh, typically the, I like French, you're showing French, but Joe challenged me today to try Cebuano. So Pick let's, something a little, let's a little go harder. ahead. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go here to Bible in every language. Um, so this is a place that you know commonly we would go for if we're looking for resources or if we're looking for um, ULB or, or even just uh, translations to be able to print out. So it's a really great place to, to find everything you need. Um, so we're gonna try that today. So I'm gonna go to the translations and let's, uh, here's a list of all the languages. I don't feel like searching all of that. So I'm just gonna start typing Subwano and there it goes, there we go. Um, so let's take a look at that. So I can see a whole bunch of resources here and I am interested in right, so unlocked sorry. dynamic. Oh, okay. You Thank you. Me. Yep. There we go. So Bono unlocked literal Bible. Uh, I want the zip. Um, so one of the things that if you get to use Orchard, pretty much everything is going to be locked up into a uh, we'll kind of eventually call it an Orchard file, but essentially their zip of contains a lot of information. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to grab that. 
So I'm going to copy this name because I see that it wants to just call it ULB. So let's go ahead and show that in the folder. I don't trust my spelling. We'll just call it subwano.zip. Great. All right, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to import that resource container, that zip file. That's key, right? So I just downloaded the zip file and now I want to import that. So I'm going to go to my downloads. There we go. Importing the resource container. So while that's importing, just to, to, to take a moment to talk about what's going on, okay. what you're doing is you're importing all of the scripture resources, all the written scripture resources. Mm -hmm. Orchard uses those written scripture resources to know about the names of the books, how many chapters are in the book, how many verses are in the book, to display the scripture, mm -hmm. if that's correct. And then it uses all that data to also change the user interface to use that language when you're navigating through the project, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And we have additional features too. So there's a lot of things that we're seeing here currently right now. And I should give you the caveat that um, uh, there are other individuals who hopefully will bring on in the future, like uh, Thomas uh, Heine, for example, who have been uh, actively working on the interface. So the everything we're looking at here, the graphics and the interface is, is what we consider minimal viable product. Right. So basically it's what we needed to put on the screen to test out the functions and make sure everything is working there. So this is not the, the final design, the look and feel. This is what we were able to rapidly put up there. So um, it's hard for us kind of going back and showing this demo knowing how cool it's gonna be looking. Um, so that, that's yet to come. Uh, now that I've, I've installed that in there, if I, if I was to go to start a project, which I'm gonna go down the bottom of the screen here with this little plus sign. And it is loading the languages. We now see at the bottom here, I now know a brand new language, which oh, is Cebuano. Yeah. And uh, now I'm going to, normally what we'd be doing is this is a source language. This is basically, what am I, what am I listening to? What am I reading? Let right. me know. Right. This is the gateway language. And what am I going to read it into? So you would normally do this, but if we were pretending we're making a gateway language, this might be the way that we do it, which is my source is Subwano, but my output is also Subwano. So that's a little bit unusual. So if I'm throwing anybody off by that, that's that's essentially the, what I'm doing there. So uh, the only choice I have here is the Subwano Unlocked Literal Bible, which happened to be what we just downloaded before. So that sounds good. And now it's going to show us all of the, the books of the Bible. Um, in Subwano, no surprise there. Mm -hmm. We'll just start at Genesis, because that's what you do. Come on. There we go. Ta-da. The Bible's big, believe it or not. The Bible's not a small book, No, as we say regularly. And so if I go here and open that verse, now we have in Cebuano the first, first verse of the first book of the Bible ready to start working with. Yeah, and notably, you did need a little bit of internet access to get that file, but then that's it. Now you're completely offline again. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think uh, that file was probably less than two megs. It wasn't very big at it's all. It's pretty small. Yeah, yeah it's uh, because it's zipped and it's, it's all text, it's pretty small. So yeah, really nice that you don't have to actually be online. And in fact, because of the nature of Orcher at the moment being in beta, which we will talk about a little bit more in the future, we can actually pre-configure a lot of this stuff before we would send it out. So if we have a project coming up or if uh, if we're going to take a bunch of uh, laptops to a to an event or something like that, we would actually do all of this in advance probably. We would do this here in the office or whatever, have all that stuff done. So for an oral Bible translator, they might not even have to do all those steps. We would, we would have that set so they would just basically come right in, their language would be loaded, their project would be ready. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So is it now a good time for the Steve Jobs, oh, one more thing or, but wait, there's more. I think it is time for that. We do have a couple of questions coming oh, okay. in as well, as well as some coaching saying, man, you guys talk fast. You got to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> okay. So we need to take a deep breath. I know we're excited. When I get excited. I, yeah, I know. I talk like I'm from New York. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what's the one more thing? Go for it. Oh, excellent. So I have been showing pretty much everything that is in the ULB, which is scripture, which is a great place to start. Um, and of course, uh, BTT Recorder is great at that. But you may not have noticed at the top of the screen, in addition to ULB, we also have the ability to record 
other resources, something that um, it might be brand new uh, for people. So if we happen to look at uh, translation questions, for example, um, if you're familiar at all with the resources, these are things to help um, both at the translation and checking the process. How do we know that it's accurate? Mm -hmm. um, and questions is a great thing. You know, notes gives us context, but questions make sure, hey, can you answer the question based that on the I, scripture. based on the mm -hmm. scripture that yeah. you translated, yeah. and that helps us know if, if you got a little bit more accurate. Well, questions are a little bit of a different animal, right? Because they are, they might be a question that spans a couple of verses in order mm -hmm. to answer the question. Or maybe there's a lot of questions packed in that particular chunk that you're going through. Right. Um, so the, it has a little bit of a different format. And of course, unlike scripture, I'm not just reading one thing, I'm reading two parts, a question and an answer. And so we have this different format. This looks different from how I've gotten there before. I would be expecting a different take layout. But what we have here is the ability to uh, record our questions and our answers. So again, Orchard allows me to start building the resources for my oral communities to use this later when they're checking their work. That's so right. I can do that very same thing. Yeah, um, and I think you're gonna show that. Um, interestingly, we are still working on the best way for translators to consume these resources. So uh, <laughs> we're all ears. If you have ideas about how you how a translator would want to use them, the notes or the questions in the translating process. In other words, how should we help them play them back? Mm -hmm. We're actually still trying to figure that out. It's not it's not a simple question, but we didn't want to hold up the recording of the resources waiting to answer that question. So Correct. we've built the framework for recording them, mm -hmm. assuming that if we build it, then we will figure out how to consume it. Yep. Yeah, no, we're very busy. I think at this stage, I think it's fair to say that we are we're actively working with uh, several partners, and thank you out there if you're watching this, who are helping us uh, use the software as they are recording the gateway languages. And we hope to start building up that library of resources to make that more useful later as you're using the software uh, to use it for translation purposes. Uh, and we're busy behind the scenes uh, building out new features for translation, which is uh, important and brand new. Things like uh, chunking or adding your own verse markers into this, which we're not showing here today. Um, but that's all stuff that is active behind the scenes and uh, we are very excited to be working with all of our partners across the world, getting their feedback on what we assume are good ideas, but we want to know what works really well for them because they're, they're the best helpers for our design. For sure. Now you just mentioned something really important, which is the idea of chunking. So. Mm -hmm. When we created Recorder many, many years ago, um, we used predefined chunks. At the time, the thinking was, well, we've got these chunks that people have gone through the Bible and decided, like, these are the appropriate chunks. But that, that is actually not in keeping with the mass methodology. Mass methodology mm -hmm. says that the translator should determine what is an appropriate chunk for them in terms of size, in terms of where it should begin and end, what's a complete thought for them. So we've been a bit constrained over the years in that um, these tools have not allowed for self-chunking. You could either do verse by verse, which of course is not what the translator decided on. It's what a group of people a long time ago decided on and put in the put in the scripture, or they could take our predefined chunks. And I know that that is something that we're working on is allowing, or Orature will allow the translator to define their own chunks. So mm -hmm. hopefully we're gonna see that here soon. Yeah. Like we would mm -hmm. say with all the things we wanna do very soon. But I know that a lot of work, design work has gone into kind of how it would look and work. And then I think you're doing some of the architectural work on it as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just to give you a quick explanation, um, it, it's already kind of in there. We just have this one section in the middle uh, of you want to start recording uh, a chapter, you would normally go through a chunking process. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to be able to build the software and, and get things functional, um, we wanted to skip that step for right now. We right. we'll set it aside. We'll get back to it when, uh, when the rest of the uh, the recording functionality is in place. Right. Which we're getting close to finished on. Right. Um, and then on the other side of it, you would have the chunks that you could record against. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, Orchard is making an assumption that that middle step has already been completed. Mm. Okay. And it just so happens that the translators chunked it along the verse lines. Okay. <laughs> so we've built the software already supporting chunking, and now we just have to go in and add the interface to be able to do it. To actually move those markers around to right. where the translator exactly. wants them. Yeah, that's good. So the engineering work, 
at least on the second part of your equation is done. Right. Now it's building that interface, figuring out a good way that a, that a translator would want to be able to listen and figure out like, okay, that's the end of a complete thought. That's the end of a complete thought, you know, mm -hmm. kind of get those where they want. And then you've got, those are probably not going to fall on verse markers. So then you've got right. to also get those verse markers in because mm -hmm. whether we like verse markers or not, verses are a thing. They, they seem to be pretty persistent. People everywhere seem to like to have verses in their Bibles. And so we don't want to lose those. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you mm -hmm. end up with an unnavigable mess. If somebody wants to then listen to scripture, they'd either have to listen to the whole chapter, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, or some verses that don't line up. And we don't we don't actually think that would be good. That's probably not what the global church would want. So we do need to kind of do both parts of those, right? Okay. So I, I apologize for speeding through Orchard, like we said before. Um, I, I really enjoy showing it off. I get very excited about it. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, there's one question here. Sorry, I got to put my reading glasses on for a second. Uh, what is the symbol next to the language name on the book buttons? And what is the image under the verse numbers? Okay, I th uh, read that one more time. This I think he's referring to this here. What is the symbol next to the language name on the book buttons? Yeah, uh, that actually I think is uh, uh, Thomas's placeholder for this is language. Okay. Yep. Okay. So maybe that's going to go away. Uh, or be replaced. Or be so replaced. another thing yeah. that uh, Thomas has often been asked about that he's. He's got a lot of placeholder icons, and okay. we'll be filling out that out. And we also have designs for helping make that. Uh, uh, how do we say that? Um, we were discussing the other day the, the to make it more accessible. Accessibility. So if you think about Windows and other th systems, allow you to uh, navigate and have helps even in the system. Like, hey, what is this I'm looking at? Right. So we're going to have that as well. Um, we're talking about a number of different ways. But uh, for now, yes, so good question. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but essentially the that's an icon for essentially this is what follows this symbol is the name of the language. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there was also what is the image under the verse numbers? Maybe that's on the next screen. Okay. I'm guessing. Oh, I think it's, it's just... Oh, it, yeah. It was just a stock, like, placeholder image. Right. So one of the things that we are working on, well, we aren't directly working on it. Christine Jarka's team has mm -hmm. a project called Art for Translators, I believe, where mm -hmm. they are creating art to represent each of the books of the Bible. There's a, a number of illustrations, many, many illustrations that have been created in case you want to have an illustrated Bible. And then our plan is to integrate some of that artwork in to help the translators navigate mm -hmm. without using the, the letters and numbers. And so exactly right now that's just a stock image. I actually have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I don't think images. any of these survive in the new design. It looks no. quite a bit different. So right. these just kind of go away. But yeah, right. I can understand why that's confusing. Uh, you look at that and like, what is that supposed to mean? Um, so the other question is uh, from several people, are you going to support translation words? And I keep asking the same question. So I know the answer, but I'll let you guys tell everybody else the answer that you keep telling me. <laughs> So yes, absolutely. Right. Um, but the the reason that we don't have translation words uh, today um, is that it's it's a little bit different in terms of structure. Right. Uh, the notes and the questions are sort of uh, they're they're pointing to scripture. Right. Uh, they're anchored and, to a verse or a chunk. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you go to set up pro a project, we we know right where to uh, to add those. Uh, those right. notes and questions. Right. Um, with words, it's it's more like a dictionary. It's mm -hmm. more like a book in itself. Right. And so we have to structure the notes and the questions in such a way that Orisher can understand it to translate a book. Right. And once we do that, then we'll be able to support words. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it is that when you have written scripture, you know, it's fairly easy for a computer to say, "Oh, well, every time this word is here, then you can link to this mm -hmm. to this dictionary entry because it's a written word and the word is the same, and that's it. You have a hyperlink, and it works." Audio is not the same way. I mean, in a sense, of course, the audio scripture is backed up by words because we know, okay, well, if it's this verse, these words are in this verse. Mm -hmm. But it comes to that same question of we we want to have the translation resources for the oral Bible translators, but actually figuring out how to deliver them and make them accessible for the Bible translator is kind of a hard problem. I think what it's gonna come down to is lots of experimentation probably. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. creating some of the content and then and then actually asking people, is it helpful like this or is it helpful like that? Do you like it like this or do you like it like that? And then we're gonna to have to assimilate that feedback and figure out 
how to build this uh, delightful user interface that will let people both access the scripture and then also to consume the resources to help them you know, do better translation. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, with that, actually, maybe I can go back to our website here for just a moment. So uh, now you've got a better understanding of Orchard, uh, maybe its use case, whether you know something that's you're interested because you actively uh, want or need to use it, or maybe you're just uh, you know interested in it, like, hey, I'd like to try it out, take it for a spin. Um, there is a download Orchard button here, uh, but frankly, what that's going to lead you to is essentially a kind of a sign up list uh, for for beta users and that kind of thing. Um, not only do we have like a sign up for our newsletter, a lot of you know uh, for announcements and and updates on that, but also uh, some some brief questions about okay, what is what is your group? Give us more definition. What are you using? What do you intend on using on? What will we download? Um, that helps us be able to uh, test on our different platforms. But another thing that we're interested in you, in uh, knowing is you know, your ability to um, help us test some of these things. So right. there's the software straight up, but there's also new design and new concept and new features yeah. where we uh, think we might have a good idea, but maybe it doesn't work for your particular group because we have uh, we're not aware of the situation. And so not only we're we looking for people to, to uh, help us understand and test the software, but also who are willing to partner with us in kind of experimenting on some design. So uh, Thomas, for example, uh, our, our designer extraordinaire, you know, comes up with a very simple kind of survey kind of stuff like, hey, here's an example of the interface and A, B or C. What, you know, what do you think you would need to click on to do that? And this gives us a good feedback in terms of, you know, are we are we bringing people along the right path toward being able to have them accomplish what they want to do? Is it intuitive? Is it simple? These sound like easy words. They're not. <laughs> well, and it's important to note we're not trying to keep people from getting Orature. What we want to do, because it's a young product, it's an immature product. It's you know we're just uh, basically premiering it today. There are a few groups that are using it for projects, and we have a very tight feedback cycle with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They let us know how it's going. We make bug fixes and changes for them. They we, they let us know how that's going. So we, we want to provide the highest level of support that we can for anybody who's using the tool, which means that we, as much as we would love to see a thousand people start translating scripture in it tomorrow, that would be an unsupportable uh, situation. We would not be able to provide the level of support that we would like to provide because Orature is on its way to becoming version 1.0. It's on its way to becoming a completed product, but it's not really a completed product yet. So we want people to have a good experience and that is gonna require us to help support them in that mm -hmm. process. So if somebody fills out this form, how long do you think they're gonna wait before they hear back from us? Uh, good question. Um, so if they're filling it out and they're willing to be a, a tester for us, um, I have a couple parameters that I'm looking for. Um, so I'll be able to let you know whether, you know, essentially, hey, this looks good, uh, stand by, or uh, thanks for your interest, we'll let you know when the official releases are coming out. Um, so I need to be a little bit judicial in terms of that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you're able to contact me, I mean, I should be able to respond to you within a, within a week in terms of information and yeah. that I've captured that information and thank you very much and welcome aboard. Yeah, the good news is that that email is not going into a black hole. It actually no. goes to Glenn. Um, you'll hear back from him. And uh, our desire is to get you going on Orchard if, you, if you're ready for it. Yeah. Um, so we're, again, we're not trying to keep anybody away from using it. We just want to be helpful in, mm -hmm. in helping people be successful with it. Good. Well, I'm very excited and Joe's done a fantastic job and Thank but you. There, there's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the reality. So uh, were there any other questions here before we let's see. I don't have any other questions. No, producer is shaking his head no. All right. Well guys, it's been great to have you in the studio. Joe, we so appreciate you being on the team and the hard work that you've put into this. I bragged on you a little bit in yesterday's show. I hope you heard that. Thank you. Um, I said it in in truth. So uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please click subscribe and like. Uh, if you are not watching it on YouTube, if you're on the live stream today, when you see Glenn's email come out telling you that it's on YouTube, please forward that email to all of your friends so they can learn about the software tools that we're using. We really do want to get the word out. You know, we don't, we don't build these tools to keep them on a shelf or just on some server somewhere. We build them because we want the global church to have access to them. We are here as a donor supported resource. Uh, many, many, tens of thousands of people support the work of Wycliffe Associates so that we can produce these things to help the world have scripture. And so a big part of that is letting the world know, hey, these tools exist. And so if you would like your Bible to either be a Bible that you can listen to, so you want to narrate it, 
Or if you don't have a Bible and you would like to translate your Bible in an oral format, these are great tools that you can use. They're free, and we are here to help you with them. That is very true. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks again, guys, and we will see you all in two weeks. We are going to be talking probably about uh, email security and things like that, I believe, is our next software showcase featuring Matt Gerber. That's at you least that's what we're thinking about. Yep. So stay tuned for that in a couple of weeks. And in the meanwhile, God bless. Thanks for being here.